Hey everyone, welcome to my channel, Books, Careers, and Prayers. My name's Leslie, and today we're gonna go over uh, my first January wrap up. All right, this year I'm doing it different. I'm going to talk about the author that I'm focusing on every month. Um, and then I'm going to kind of talk about similarities between the books that I read uh, for whatever particular month it is. Um, and maybe any differences I noticed. So I started off light. I picked an author that has um, one short story collection and one debut novel um, just to kind of get the practice, <laughs> kind of figure out what I'm doing. And my focus is on Kelly Fajardo and Stein. So there's Sabrina and Karina and Woman of Light. All right, so... Um, I was hoping to like memorize all my little notes, but I don't think it's possible. So I went ahead and I, I think at the end of every month as I'm writing all my notes for um, each book, I'm picking a section and I'm focusing on the author. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm gonna be kind of trying my best to look at the camera, but I might need to just like, I don't know, read it like this, I'm not sure yet. Alright, so I watched it a bunch of interviews and I'm also going to leave links to all the references where I got this information. So everything I'm saying is just um, from other resources. Uh, specifically a bunch of different interviews that I watched. Um, I'm fortunate enough that this author did plenty of interviews during the pandemic. So there's plenty of um, interviews on YouTube to gather information from. So all the resources are gonna, just gonna be from um, other channels, interviews with the author. And so a little bit of background on the author. Um, she has seven siblings, six are girls, one is a boy. The author is the second oldest and there are two sets of twins that are siblings, which I thought was absolutely wild. Um, her family settled in Colorado, much like the characters in her books. She dealt with depression in her younger years. She dropped out of high school, eventually went back to college herself, and now she's, if not already a teacher at a university in Texas, she's going to start teaching there. There's a couple of interviews I, I watched and I realized I didn't pay attention to the date. <laughs> um, so I found, uh, the, how should I say this, the book research really fascinating because not only does it shed more light on the author, um, but also the characters. And so the author said in an interview that she went to uh, state centers of Colorado and Gian, Gina, how do I say it? Genealogy <laughs> archives. Um, and something that she noticed is that there was like this erasure taking place. There wasn't any data on people of Colorado, sorry, people of Colorado um, for like the demographic she was looking for, Mexican American, indigenous. And so that really drives home the point of her wanting to write her short story collection and her novel. Although they're works of fiction, she's adding back into the canon people that have just been um, erased, purposefully erased. Um, let me see. Oh, one of the points she made about research, I was so glad to hear because it actually had to do with um, something that I really appreciated that she had in her novel, Woman of Light. I talked about it at length in my review, my book chat. Um, she included this moment where their character Luce is hiding because there is a, like a clan march coming through and the character observes how there's these little babies being swept up in this that also have like the 
the clan outfit costume or whatnot and this is material that the author actually saw in real life while she was doing her research she did see that they had like these outfits for babies and I thought that was really like scary and powerful and I don't want to repeat myself too much but very much like in the book it just makes you realize like how deeply ingrained people put this really racist ideology onto their children and um I don't know how else to say it other than I'm glad she put it in the book because I actually think that's a really important point to recognize and how um, this kind of gets uh, passed down very uh, purposefully and at a very young age. And in fact, it actually reminded me of um, this exhibit I went to. I'm somewhat near the downtown Central Library in Los Angeles and there is an exhibit I mean, it was years ago, but it specifically talked about uh, propaganda that was used during the Holocaust. And, you know, the, I was really just kind of blown away at what children were participating at at a young age. And there would be like these board games that really... Um, created like a mini version of what was happening in real life but it was normalizing what happened during the holocaust to um these children and then you just see how like oh these kids consume this ideology from a very young age so that's kind of what it reminded me of and that's why i appreciated why it was in the book but moving along um there were certain things um about the characters that the author talked about that she pulled from real life. So although um, there might be elements from people in her real life that she took from, but then she let the characters kind of take um, a life of their own. For instance, the character Luce is based on her aunt Lucille. And in real life, she had the, um, the gift of a seer like the character Luce does. And much like Luce, she did have to hide under floorboards from um, a clan march. So she really did experience that. Uh, Diego is um, based on an uncle figure, but then she did change a character. Like I said, she does all of them, kind of lets them become their own thing. Marie Oh no, I'm sorry. Maria Josie is the most fascinating character for me. And I was so glad to find out that this is also based on someone in the author's life and in the book, which I didn't discuss because I didn't want my video to be super long. Um, Maria Josie is a character that really is a matriarch of the family. From a very young age, she fled where she was at to settle in Colorado. And she did that alone. She did that pregnant. And if it wasn't for her courage to do what she did, in the book, the rest of the family wouldn't have resettled in Colorado like they did. And that's exactly what happened to um, the author's family in real life. And much like the character in the book, um, the real life person was also a lesbian. And I found that fascinating because what the author drives home in both books, in the short story and the novel, is just the social ideal that a woman has to be married to a man, um, has to secure themselves, has to keep themselves safe, and that could only be done through marriage. And so you see this person that's strong, the matriarch, holding the family together, but she's not someone that has um married a man or like secure that part of her life and so she does have a tough life but she's also uh like resilient and strong and making whatever she needs to do she's making it happen and that's what i really loved about her character and i wanted to say too much because I, I swear to you i'll tell you everything about that character because <laughs> i really loved that character so much something else that i learned 
and I can't say I just learned it from the book because I read it and it there's something that flew over my head because I don't know the history enough behind it but I did learn from an interview I think it was with PBS Books and that's about the Sand Creek Massacre. In the books the character Pidre which is the uh, grandfather of Luz at some point he wants to resettle with his um, family that he left when when he kind of wanted to go off on his own right but when he went there he just realized that he was coming across a ghost town and no one was no longer there and that's because people were just constantly forced out people would settle and then people would come in and colonize and force people out for oil or whatever whatnot reasons and so that moment in the book is actually somewhat influenced by that particular massacre but also so many other events have happened like that and still happen to this day so that's something that I learned about in the interview and I'm definitely gonna actually want to do more research about that particular massacre because I don't know anything about it I really enjoyed learning about the author's um, work ethic so she did at some point talk about her writing process. For instance, she'll give herself a quota, like today I need to write a thousand words or 500 words. She just gives herself a quota and it's not necessarily about having the perfect story written just right. It's just about getting it done, which leads to another really good tip the author gave, which is just get it down, write it. If you know you have to write, um, a particular section in a book and it's something that you're finding boring just write it because you know you're gonna come back and write several drafts anyways so at least you get like the foundation the skeleton of of the story have you and so I really like that she, she was really focusing on like getting it done and knowing that she could go back rather than putting a person in a position to get stuck And in speaking of getting stuck, the author also talks about whenever there's a time where she is at that point, she will actually remove herself from, let's say, just writing and will leave and do research. So she's still actively working, but she's just like, her creative juices are not really there and she needs to just re replenish her creative bank. So she'll go off, maybe she'll go to a location that she knows she's writing in the book to kind of like reset herself. And I really appreciated that conversation about learning where your mental state is at and how you could like feed yourself, you know, um, give yourself like some sort of time to gather your energy again to go back to writing. And um, something else she talks about is how her novel actually took her 10 years to write. And that's important to know for, I feel like, anyone that loves writing is just that... I think this, there's this idea of what you're going to write and like the finished product. And those are just not the same things. And how the author was self-aware. She knew when she started she wasn't really ready yet but she actively wrote anyways and just kept layering things in until of course she had all the skills and so now moving forward at some point maybe she'll write faster because she's honed so many different writing skills along the way and I just thought that was really cool I actually really enjoyed learning that about the author all right so that's basically all the background and little fun facts I learned about the writing process um, so now I just want to talk about the similarities between both books and I noticed in both books they do talk about um, racism, misogyny, colorism, what is home, the pressures of what the social status quo is, family dynamics, and very specifically female dynamics. And although those are displayed like as themes in both books, I 
enjoyed her approach. For instance, uh, a similar, oh, how do I say this? <laughs> Similarity that I noticed was in the short story collection, the author has a short story called Sisters, uh, which is actually one of the stories that I discussed when I was talking about Sabrina and Karina in my book chat. One character gets married and makes it pretty clear she's just trying to secure her future and her sister doesn't want to get married and it's actually to her detriment. She ends up being physically harmed and my battery is about to run out so I'll make this quick. Um, those are things that come up against in both books. Um, in Sisters, it's, there's like physical harm that happens. And I want to say there's kind of like a similar incident um, in the book. But I like how it all plays out in the novel because I feel like the author has time to craft this long saga of a story and flesh out the characters. And although I feel like at times Sabrina Karina has a stronger, uh, more pointed way of making it clear what the themes are in the book. I liked the subtleties of Woman of Light. And also the novel allows time to explore very specific like um, uh, historical events that happened in real life and um, are able to be fleshed out into this fictional world. And lastly, because my battery is going to go out <laughs> any second now, I'll quickly say that in one of the interviews, um, the author and the interviewer brought up a conversation around magical realism, which is something that I've been having an issue about being a reader and talking about books. Um, in November, I read like 11 different <laughs> books and I love to listen to like author conversations and read articles about authors. And I'm learning that like not all cultures like that to be referenced. I think that comes from like Latin America in a way, a conversation um, or, or the creation of the term magical realism. But for some people, um, specifically like let's say in the indigenous community for example, magical realism means that, how do I say this? The magical element isn't magic, right? People are talking about things that happen in real life that are part of their uh, spiritual existence. And so using that term and then applying it to other cultures doesn't really work because that's not actually what's going on. And in the novel, A Woman of Light, there, oh, how should I say this? The main character is a seer. So she has visions and that's very real for the character and that's very real for um, the author's aunt in real life. So the term magical realism doesn't apply. Um, it doesn't fit and it's just real. And so that's something that I've actually been glad to hear the author talk about because when I do read books by other cultures and I do see like certain elements I just want to make sure that I use a right language or the most fitting language and I'm not always sure like how to na navigate that and make sure the words I use are like appropriate. And so even in some of the reviews or like book chats I have on Instagram about the books that I like, um, I was like just try my best to be careful to not use the word magical realism, which I know could easily be like a catchphrase for other people that haven't read the book to understand exactly what I'm talking about. And so I'm still navigating that. So I, I appreciate the conversation. Anyways, I cannot believe my camera is still on. If you're watching this, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate all the support. Um, if you can, like, subscribe, make a comment. Um, all that actually does really help. And Let's the YouTube algorithm know to pass me along. <laughs> um, and I don't have anything else other to say. I'm dwindling on time. 
just know that in the month of February I will be focusing on James Baldwin and other books that are in reference to his book um, The Fire next time and that'll be the next focus and that's gonna be uh, a ton of work that I look forward to because that author has such a large body of work which means there's so many more interviews for me to go through and enjoy and to learn about the author's life. So thanks again and I'll see you later.